Hi Raju, I hope you are doing well. Today we will discuss a rare fever disease representing a challenging diagnosis. Recently with colleagues we discussed a case of Kikushi disease with neurological involvement. Wow, Kikuchi Fujimoto disease. It's interesting, Michael, that you should uh, choose to discuss this because I too have had a case recently and uh, probably this situation we will discuss later. But this is the disease with the typical presentation with a subacute onset of low-grade fever and lymphadenopathy. Michael, I must challenge one part of what you said. Perhaps it is rare in the West. It's supposed to be quite common in the Far East. But in India, I would call it uncommon, but not so rare. Okay, but the problem with this disease is that the symptoms are non-specific, and these non-specific symptoms are found very frequently in children. And so, like for many rare diseases, it's often overlooked. The aim of this episode is to give you the keys to correctly diagnosing this syndrome. Absolutely, Michael. Accurate diagnosis is completely essential because the differential diagnosis of this condition could be very serious illnesses such as lymphoma or, in fact, it could often be the first sign or the precursor to lupus. So, Kikushi-Fujimoto syndrome is a necrotizing histiocytic lymphadenitis that mainly affects young women. It presents with persistent fever, swelling of one or more lymph nodes, often in the posterior cervical region, sometimes from 2 to 7 centimeters, intense fatigue, and sometimes night sweats. Its main differential diagnosis in pediatrics are inflammatory diseases and lymphoma. But it's a benign disease with a spontaneously favorable outcome in one to four months, but it can evolve into lupus as you were already mentioning. True, with the presence of fever, fatigue, and night sweats, it is obvious that lymphoma would be a scary differential diagnosis. And as I mentioned, Michael, the disease is more prevalent in Asia with some HLA associations. It's relatively uncommon in the pediatric age group, but the cause is not really known. There's a link that there could be a viral trigger or even an autoimmune mechanism has been suggested, which could explain the link with lupus. So let's come back to the clinical presentation. The main manifestation is posterior cervical adenopathy, often painful, but other sites are also described, or it could be multinodal, but it's rarely described as generalized. Fatigue, Anorexia, hepatosplenomegaly, and arthritis are common symptoms. Polymorphic skin involvement is frequently described, sometimes with leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but there is also an involvement of the mucosal, in particular, the oral mucosa. Neurological symptoms were also described in up to 5% of the patients, and the manifestation include aseptic meningitis, optic neuritis, meningoencephalitis, or cerebellar manifestations. Pro Michael, I think to this podcast you have also attached a case report of a patient with limbic encephalitis, and that really did make an interesting reading. But when you come to the laboratory diagnosis, The blood tests are mildly indicative. There may be a mild anemia, invariably a leukopenia. And whatever investigations are done, those are done to rule out differential diagnoses such as infections, hematological diseases, 
or autoimmune illnesses. And to help the clinician, ultrasound can show for the lymphadenitis some signs that may help for the differential diagnosis. But, and this is very important, the hallmark for diagnosis is the biopsy of the affected lymph nodes. It will first help to exclude malignancies or chronic infection, like tuberculosis, for example. And the histopathology will show accumulation of histocytes and necrosis with three different evolving patterns, proliferative, necrotizing, and xanthomatous. And <clears throat> Michael, you know, in this particular entity, immunohistochemistry with very specific sort of markers for the histocytes can help the pathologist very easily. But we will not go into the histopathologist period. But just one very important point that I picked up, and that is that an aspiration or a core biopsy might sometimes miss the diagnosis. And therefore, it is advised that a full biopsy of the lymph node, an excisional biopsy, be performed, not only because you don't wish to miss the diagnosis, but excising the lymph node occasionally has been found to be therapeutic. Yes, and so let's go to the therapy now. So there is no specific therapy for this disease. And since this is a self-limiting disease, the management is essentially symptomatic with the aim to control fever, pain, and inflammation. In rare cases where symptoms are particularly severe, prednisone is used to control inflammation and provide relief to the patient. Resolution of the symptoms within weeks is observed in most patients. And in about 20% of them, the disease has a recurrent pattern. And when it's recurrent, it's often multinodal and an autoimmune disease will develop in about a third of these patients. Recently, we followed a 10-year-old girl with recurrent kikushi who developed a lupus after two years of disease. But here, what is your experience with this syndrome, Raju? Would you ask me this, Michael? You know, if you recall, I said at the beginning of this podcast that I would tell you about the child I saw recently. This was an adolescent girl. And her first episode had happened approximately two years ago. And this was a cervical lymph node. So she received naproxen and she also received steroids. And she recovered. Then recently she had yet another episode of Kikuchi. Uniquely, besides the Kikuchi lymph node, which was biopsied, there were two atypical features. First, this child's lymph node, which had enlarged, was a mediastinal lymph node. And the second peculiar aspect was its recurrence and her ANA was 1 in 320. No other markers for lupus were there, clinical or serological. So now what do we do in a scene like this? I have discussed with the family that this could be a disease in evolution and put the child only on hydroxychloroquine. I need your opinion, Michael. Would you do anything different? No, because I don't think we can treat a potential lupus before it's there. But giving hydroxychloroquine is a good idea, uh, since if it's really a disease developing, that might make that the disease will maybe slower develop or not develop. So I, I would do exactly the same. But we need to speak with the parents because this is not evidence-based medicine and there are pro and cons. And so it's important to be sure that the parents understand and agree with this. Now, concerning neurological involvement, I found a recent report on a 20-year-old female who, after two months of illness, presented a bilateral tonic-clonic seizure 
and after four months gait ataxia and impaired immediate and recent memory. MRI was suggestive of limbic encephalitis, as you were mentioning it before, and under high dose of corticosteroid treatments with tapering over eight weeks, she presented rapid improvement and complete resolution of all disease manifestations. But Michael, let's make this clear to the audience that these sort of cases are the exception and not the rule. By and large, this is a benign and self-limiting disease. Uh, one should rule out infections and malignant diseases. The treatment is supportive. And if there are recurrences, then we need to follow up these patients for the development of autoimmune illnesses. Yes, Raju, thank you for this uh, resume of this uh, podcast. And on the website, you will find two reviews on the disease and the case report of Kikushi with neurological involvement. Michael, thanks for that. those very fascinating review articles. Thank you to you, Raju. See you in a month.